Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 350 Denver meeting. We're going to go ahead and get started. If you have not, if you could please leave yourself on mute to prevent background noise, that would be great. Um, we're going to get started tonight with the very first of our new webinar series in the new normal that is today, and I hope everybody is happy, healthy, and safe. Um, tonight, we're going to be doing a presentation on healthy soil and regeneration. Um, I met this speaker actually at the Planet in Peril. We were sitting next to each other during the panelist portion of that climate justice senatorial forum. Um, so I'm proud to introduce Mandy McGill, who is the founder of Tribe Green Rising and the Regenerative Revolution Hubs and is committed to providing awareness of and access to regenerative local foods, products, and services. Uh, Mandy grew up in a small Colorado town with a deep love of nature and all of Earth's amazing creatures as she spent her childhood hiking, camping, climbing mountains, and studying animals in the environment. With a background in sociology and environmental affairs, she passionately educates on the cultivation of a regenerative mindset utilizing the concepts of regenerative agriculture and holistic management. The regenerative mindset empowers people to think holistically like an ecosystem, therefore mimicking the intrinsic balance of nature. It provides the galvanizing force behind creating collaborative community with the emphasis being on unity as we collectively work towards a regenerative future. And so without further ado, I will now turn it over to Mandy. Hello, thank you so much. Thank you, Sunny, and thank you 350 Denver and 350 Colorado for having me. I greatly appreciate it. Um, yeah, so Tribe Green Rising, we really focus on educating and bringing about awareness for regenerative agriculture, holistic management, and local food access, as we really believe that this is the core essence of how we're really going to move into a regenerative future. Um, the number of problems addressed when we look at regenerative ag um, in a holistic context is, it's amazing. It's kind of the main domino that starts to hit all the other dominoes that we really need for this whole future to become something that's really bright. So I want to dive right in, but first I want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, in past talks, um, I have kind of steered away from some uncomfortable topics, but the more I have talked to people and done some research and studied this and done talks, I've realized we really need to talk about some of these uncomfortable things so that we can see the big picture and, and actually come together to make a change. Um, but I'm gonna start off with something, something fun, which is how does nature actually work? I feel it's important to try to lay a foundation of some basic understanding so that we can kind of pull back and look at a bigger picture. And I don't think a lot of people really saw, you know, back in elementary or middle school when we had lessons on photosynthesis or the carbon cycle or, or anything like that, quite how important that was. But photosynthesis literally oh. important. Um, and so specifically in regards to soil regeneration and the action of ruminants, so grazing animals like bison, elk, um, cows, uh, that's the main points I want to focus on. So photosynthesis, a very basic definition is we have carbon dioxide and sunlight being transformed through green growing plants into carbohydrates and sugars that are then fed to all of these amazing underground you know, organisms and bacteria and life that's happening. And, um, and there's a whole liquid carbon pathway that happens. So um, as the carbon dioxide and sunlight are being transformed and pulling down carbon, so we have carbon sequestration and it's being sequestered underground, all of the, the living plants and trees, they keep obviously some of the carbohydrates and sugars for themselves, but they feed this whole vast network of underground life. So in one handful of healthy soil, we have more life than people on the face of the planet. And we only know about 10% of those or so, because it's a little bit of a newer frontier, maybe in the past 10, 15 years that we've been trying, maybe even less than. Um, and so there's, there's all this activity going on underground. And we have something else called mycorrhizal fungi. So it's 
fungus that actually attaches itself to the root systems of these trees and shrubs and grasses and plants, and it creates connections. So there's this whole transfer of nutrients and communication and water and this whole thing happening. So we have this vast amount of life just going on all the time underneath our feet and we have no real idea about that. So I really think it's important to see this idea of, of photosynthesis. Um, so healthy living soils, the microbiome of the planet. So when I think of like, we, we, a lot of us now know about the microbiome of our own bodies. And when we have a healthy balance of gut bacteria, our own immune system works so much better. We have our digestions working better. We sleep better. Our mood is better. It really regulates everything in our body. That's what healthy living soils are for the planet as well. So I see the entire planet as one body and the amazing microbiome that surrounds it is healthy living soil. And through industrial um, actions on the land, we've really interrupted that, especially in more recent years, like the past 70 years. Um, but it's a really important aspect of keeping everything regenerating and ecosystems operating the way that they should. So I go into the carbon cycle as well with that. Um, everything in nature is circular. So, and, and carbon is not a bad thing. It's, it's not that it shouldn't be in the atmosphere. It's just that currently, especially with the more industrial level of society that we're at since the mid 1800s and right around early 1900s, we're pulling tons of this concentrated carbon out of the ground and it's getting dispersed you know, in the atmosphere in very small particles and its return path back into the planet is through photosynthesis. But when we do these industrial actions on the land like tilling and planting of monocrops, which is thousands of acres of the same crop, we're spraying pesticides and all these different industrial aspects, we're breaking that return path. So we have a lot of it going up and it's not coming back the way it should. Now, one way that it is coming back to the planet is not, not necessarily a good thing. The oceans are absorbing a ton of our carbon. So when carbon dioxide combines with the oceans, it turns into carbonic acid. And so we end up seeing the acidification of oceans. We're seeing shell growing animals not able to grow shells anymore. We're reaching these tipping points with coral reefs um, dying. Those are massive keystone ecosystems in the ocean. Um, and so we have this whole thing happening that's just kind of rolling even faster because we're hitting these tipping points. We have um, the runoff in the spring, especially from the Midwest farmlands of all of the chemicals and everything from those farmlands going down the tributaries, down the Mississippi, into the Gulf, and we have a huge dead zone where nothing can grow. So it just creates this whole trickle down effect of all these unintended consequences. And so that's another aspect, right? So I've talked about photosynthesis and then we've talked about carbon cycle. And then I wanna go into ruminants and the way they have a very special relationship with the planet. So, and I, I again, just wanna reiterate, I just wanna lay this foundation. So when I go into these other topics, it's, we have this foundation to look at of how nature actually operates. So when we look at ruminants, they have an incredible relationship with the planet that most people don't realize. Um, and they co-evolved with especially seasonal rainfall areas and native grassland prairies. So they have, most of them have four chambered stomachs. Some of, some of them have three, um, but their first chamber of their stomach is called the rumen. And that's a whole compartment that is all bacteria that is meant to break down the cellulose in the plant cell walls of the grasses and plants that they're eating to turn it into nutrition for the animal. And then on top of that, they have all these other aspects of the way that they operate with the land that regenerate. So their feces and urine um, fertilize the land as they move. They have their mouths tearing at the grasses and the way that action happens, it actually spurs growth above and below ground. Um, but even their saliva has an action around that as well in terms of fertilizing or just creating these actions that are really important on the land. Um, and then the way their hooves break the soil crust. So this is not like the mechanical tilling that we do in industrial farming operations. This is just the, the breaking of soil crust as they move and it allows water infiltration and they're pressing seeds into the ground. And historically, the way that they have moved has been um, determined by pack hunting predators. So these large pack hunting predators kept ruminants moving in these tight knit herds as they went across the land and they wouldn't return to these areas for months. And so that land would have time to rest um, and regenerate, but they moved fairly quickly. So, so there's this whole coevolution co of ruminants with the grasslands that is incredibly important. Um, so that is kind of 
the broad realm of photosynthesis, carbon cycle, and ruminants, and how all of that works together. But then what is actually happening? Because we're seeing so many issues of climate change and too much carbon in the atmosphere and lack of health in our food. So what's actually happening? So we've industrialized every segment of complex systems that we possibly can. So the main complex systems are going to be our bodies, um, land and nature, and communities and society. So these are living, self-organizing, complex systems that are not like machines, and we're treating them like machines. So when you have a machine that, you know, a part breaks, and then it doesn't work anymore, you fix the part, and then it works again, that's, that's it. But with a complex living system, we have all of these self-organizing things that when, you know, for example, we're losing 200 species a day on average right now due to extinction, and, and yet the earth is still here. It's degenerating and we're losing biodiversity, but it's still here because it's still reorganizing and reabsorbing these changes and, and making changes as it goes. And it's the same thing with our bodies and with our, um, our complex societies as well. So, so when we look at like our body, for example, we, we're very much treating um, our bodies like agricultural land. So with our bodies, we have um, pills and with land we have pesticides and with our bodies we have surgery and with land we have tilling so when you look at that in terms of um, the main way that western societies deal with with illness or disease we take a pill or we have surgery and it's not to say that those shouldn't happen in certain instances we just do that for kind of everything and so we might take a pill for like a digestion problem but then we end up with you know five more pills that we need to take because we have side effects from that and a, a really good way to, to see that connection of the fact that the whole body is connected is 90% um, of our serotonin is developed in our gut from healthy bacteria, which is a happy hormone and that regulates our mood. And that's a brain chemical and yet it comes from our gut. So when we treat the body like it's separate systems, you know, we have lung specialists, we have heart specialists, we have brain specialists but they don't really talk to each other. And so we might have somebody who has this problem over here, but really it's because of a problem in the gut or something like that. So it's an example of how we continue to kind of break apart these complex systems. With agriculture, it's the same thing. Really good example with that would be the fact that ruminants, so these grazing animals that eat grass, that is their diet, they have been taken off of land to put in concentrated animal feeding operations, so CAFOs, and they are now being fed these industrial monocrops. So crops that are you know, thousands of, of acres of the same thing, like corn and soy, and they're being fed that in these concentrated animal feeding operations, and yet that's not what they eat. So you're, you're also dealing with them being sick from that since that's not uh, the kind of food that they need. And then on top of that, they're standing in their own manure for a lot of that time too. And it's, so it's not a healthy thing. And that manure should be fertilizer for the land if they were moving the way that nature intended. So another example of a broken ecosystem and an animal that really should be on grassland and yet we've segmented this animal off of the land and we're seeing all of these impacts from that. So, you know, we've also increased human population. We have cities and roads and and towns in the way of how these herds would normally move. So there's a lot of reasons why we don't have the kind of movement of these ruminant animals the way that we used to. And in North America, there used to be over 50 species of large grazing animals and in huge numbers too. And now we're down to 11 and in much smaller numbers. So that's another impact. And so we're losing that connection of the ruminants with the grasslands and just in terms of that whole regeneration and the way nature operates. So when you see like cows on pasture, and this gets into a whole thing with grass fed, 100% grass fed, a um, little bit of an off subject, 80% of grass fed beef that's um, from the United States is not actually from the United States, it's from uh, places like Brazil. Um, and the reason why is there, there are loopholes in our industrial food supply chains that allow that to happen. And so, you know, you go to a store and you buy 100% grass fed from America, it's probably not from America and the way it's being grass fed, if you look out at a pasture of cows that are just all roaming all over the place, wherever they want to go, they know what they want to eat. So they're going to pick the most nutritious grasses. And in that way, the land ends up getting overgrazed and it tips it into desertification. So that's why so many of these areas that are outside of the more humid parts of the world, like along the equator, 
we're seeing massive desertification. So most deserts aren't normal and people don't realize that. We do have true deserts, but most are not normal. Sahara Desert is a really good example of something that shouldn't be a desert. It used to be a green oasis and now it's a desert and they, they are thinking that what happened is way back in the day you had herders moving their animals in a way that they were thinking they should be moved or letting them kind of pick where they wanted to go. And that's what kind of created this cyclical aspect of the desertification of that land. So the Sahara Desert, which we all see as this iconic desert, shouldn't even be a desert. So those are another, it's another example of how we have broken these connections. So um, Earth's land area is upwards of 40% grassland and 70% of that 40% um, is desertifying and it's a massive ecosystem and a keystone ecosystem just like the coral reefs in the ocean. Um, we're losing 75 billion tons of topsoil per year off of agricultural lands, mostly off of agricultural lands, and it's due to erosion and runoff and just the water not being able to go into the ground for all these other um, industrial reasons of how we practice agriculture. And then another example is our communities and society. So society industrialized heavily around the mid 1800s and we specialized our, our jobs um, and basically ended up outsourcing basic needs and human connection. And a couple of examples of that would be our food production. So we have a national and global food supply chain when we used to grow our own food. And we, we rate, um, a lot of us have to hire people to raise our children um, when we used to do that ourselves. So we've kind of, and I wanna say, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm not placing judgment on that. I just want us to look at the dichotomy of what used to be when we used to grow our own food and we knew where it came from. Um, we used to be at home more and be able to raise our kids. Um, and so we've kind of gone into this level of industrialization where so many things are segmented in terms of food and land and nature and even our societies and the way that we work that we're seeing massive disconnections and things breaking and degenerating as we go. Um, and it didn't used to be like this. You know, this is all part of a much larger societal mindset. Um, but we've been in it so long. You know, most people alive in the United States today were born into this. So we can't see the forest for the trees. You know, we're in it and we, we wouldn't know that there's a different way to be. Um, so I want to talk about why is all this happening? And it really comes down to mindset. So, and it's our collective mindset. It's not just one person. It's kind of this like overall collective mindset, especially of industrialized societies. And it's been like this for millennia, just like I was saying. And it's, um, we're re really seeing the culmination of these impacts now um, as they speed up. So we have the re a reductive mindset versus a regenerative mindset. And the reductive aspect goes back to what I was talking about with how we're treating complex living systems like they're machines. We're reducing complexity down to simplicity. So it's kind of like that band-aiding notion, like, oh, there's a problem over there and we'll patch it up with this. And oh, now there's you know, seven other problems over here. We have to patch those. So that's where we start to see that when you pull on that one thread, everything else moves. And so it, we, but we continue to do this kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's not about blaming any, anyone or any system. This thing it has been going on forever and it's been kind of building on itself. And the industrialization of agriculture really um, gained a lot of momentum and got really cemented in our in the United States when Earl Butts uh, was the US Secretary of Agriculture back in the 70s and his big mantra was get big or get out and the idea of that was you know a lot of these small family farms just started getting absorbed into these bigger and bigger farms that have become these industrial corporate owned farms and that's where we're starting to see all of the degradation of the land when it didn't used to be like that so we don't even realize that it's happening. Um, another aspect is that only 1% of US farmland is or is certified organic. And of that 1%, most of that, I would say 90 plus percent of that is uh, industrial organic. So even organic in and of itself can be still degenerating on the land and in terms of our health as well, um, because it's being done, it's being raised in this industrial way. So. So I want to go over just a couple of examples of how this kind of mindset, when we have good intentions, it still ends up hurting the thing that we think that we're fixing. So I see a lot of stuff on Facebook right now, well, have been for a while, of people switching from dairy to almond milk. 
Well, a couple of things that aren't known about almond milk, I mean, the biggest thing is where is it coming from? And is the way that the almonds are being grown, is it mimicking nature? And the answer is no. Um, mostly these are coming from conventional almond orchards in California. They're being sprayed with pesticides because it is a monocrop and bees are being shipped in from thousands of miles away to pollinate these crops. And they're, it, they're going into war, you know, not only the pesticides and toxins that they're coming into contact with, but they're out of their territory. And we're seeing these massive collapse um, issues of bee colonies. So that's one example of people thinking that they're doing something good. Oh, we'll switch to almond milk and get away from this industrial dairy. Well, we're, we're going to industrial almond milk, even if it's or, organic, it's basically less toxic, but still an industrial monocrop. Um, and another fallout of this, and this is why I talk about this stuff, because I really want people to let it sink in how much our decisions impact on so many multiple levels. And the issue that's happening right now is because there has been no ability for industrial dairy farmers to transition um, to doing something that's more healthy, uh, there, we're actually seeing a rise in dairy farmer suicide because they didn't, they didn't have an ability to switch. So the rug is just getting pulled out from under them. And, and so that's a massive impact right there that, that was not intended, but it's happening. And already farmers um, are double the current rate of suicide in the United States. And these are things that are not talked about, but it's things that need to be known. Um, so these are the kinds of impacts that we have to think about. And it's really about where did it come from? How was it grown? What is the source? Um, you know, that kind of a thing. And people don't think past what the thing is on the shelf. So, you know, we've never had a problem with a lack of food. It's a problem with the system. We have 40% food waste in the United States. Um, and it's, you know, global and national food systems that aren't able to handle uh, what's happening, especially like when we look at the current example with COVID, we have long food bank lines. And at the same time, we have industrial milk, thousands of gallons being poured down the drain. We have crops rotting in fields. And the worst part, we have chickens and pigs being euthanized because there's nowhere for them to go because they're being raised in this industrial way. So they're in these barns and the industrial treadmill is no longer happening. So for a bit of time, uh, they were feeding them soy holes. So not, no nutrition in soy holes. It was just to fill their stomachs so that they wouldn't grow anymore and outgrow the barn. But if that doesn't work, which it's not because this is going on longer, than the industrial system can deal with. And so now they're being euthanized. So it, multiple layers of these issues, and this is what we have to wrap our head around if we're gonna change these things. So I feel it's important to, oh, I do wanna say one of the big um, mantras that is said by the, you know, the huge global food system giants is we have to feed the world. No, we don't. We have to feed ourselves. We have to feed our communities. We have to think locally. That's how we feed the world. Otherwise, we end up with these issues of food supply uh, system breakdown. We have people going hungry, which we had long before COVID, you know, all of these different uh, layers of issues. So I feel it's important to point things like this out because what I'm getting to is, is that mindset that we're in. Um, and the way that we know uh, that, that, wait, what did I say? <laughs> um, Oh, here we go. So basically, I'm always trying to think of how can I explain something so that we can really wrap our heads around it. If you told me, okay, we have a new planet Earth that's completely perfect, all the ecosystems are in balance, we're all going to move there, we would still destroy that planet. And it's because of our mindset. So that whole notion of like, let's not fix this one, let's not think about why it's breaking, let's just go to the next planet. It's that doesn't really work because we are still in that reductive mindset. So, um, so okay, so I've kind of gone over some, some big pieces and I'm getting ready to go into more of the solution side of this, but this is where Sunny, I wanted to stop and uh, see if I need to clarify anything or if there's any questions. <clears throat> um, I think I... Oh, you're on mute, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think I might have forgotten to clarify at the beginning, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. And at the end of Mandy's discussion, um, we'll answer those questions or you can hit the raise hand button. 
um, as we get towards the end. And if you don't know where that is, if you click the participants button, it should pop up near the bottom of that that says raise hand. And we'll, um, Mandy will answer those uh, as we proceed. So if there's nothing specific to, to clarify right now, I can go through the next segment and then we can have a conversation about it. Okay, thanks. Sound good? Okay. Yeah. So what is the solution then to all of these crazy, you know, self-fulfilling problems? We have, it, really we're moving into more of a holistic context, a regenerative mindset. It's collaborative and it's looking at the big picture. Um, so what's an example? Let's look at regenerating the land. How do we regenerate land? Well, the biggest one is getting ruminants back on the land. And it's not just about putting ruminants back on the land. It's about having a way of looking at the system that you want to regenerate, the land you want to regenerate, and, and having a system for how to plan so that it does regenerate the land and doesn't have those unintended consequences. Um, so I want to focus on that because remember back when I talked about, you know, the, the way that their hooves break the soil crust, that water infiltration, all those different actions that actually regenerate. There's ways that regenerative farmers and ranchers move, um, move ruminants so that they actually regenerate and it basically mimics, mimics exactly how they used to move back in the day when it was the pack hunting predators that kept them tightly knit and moving along. So they use electric fencing and they basically are able to move these paddocks. So they have them on that land for a couple of days and it's depending on you know, the time of year and how much the grass is growing and how much you know, rain and all those things for uh, the kind of nutrition that those animals are getting, but then they move them on after like a day or two. Um, and as they move them, they're not gonna bring them back to that paddock for a while because that, that land's gonna regenerate and it's gonna have this burst of growth. So it's this way of farming that, that basically tries to deal with this larger issue that we're seeing of, of desertification and all the issues with the industrial side. So it's bringing back to that local, more small level and being able to really be involved with what is actually happening on the land and is it improving? That's the biggest thing. Regenerative agriculture is the land improving. It's not, not about sustainability because at this point the land is so degenerated that we don't want to sustain that. We really need to regenerate. We need to restore health and improve um, the amount of soil organic matter um, happening in that soil. So it also rebalances the carbon cycle along with a small water cycle, along with photosynthesis. It restores biodiversity above and below ground. I don't know if anybody saw The Biggest Little Farm. I'm sure a lot of people have. Um, but that, you know, you saw over the course of years that they were bringing life back to that land, just this explosion of biodiversity and everything regained balance. You know, I remember the part where it was like, all of the snails on the trees, I think it was, and they brought in the ducks because they love the snails, you know. So it's, they were, they were just thinking, okay, holistically, how do we think about this? Instead of poisoning all these snails, there's got to be a better way. And there is, because nature finds balance. That's the natural balance of nature. Um, so carbon sequestration, that's another massive aspect of regenerative agriculture. Um, and especially with grasslands, uh, grassland prairies and native grasslands, they have deep tap roots and they're at varying levels of depth in the soil. And they can sequester carbon for millennia as long as it's not disturbed through like tilling or something like that. Um, and what's amazing is for every 1% of soil organic matter that's added to a piece of land through these practices, so that's more carbon, that's more soil life, you can hold an extra 25,000 gallons of water on that land. So that is drought, flood, and fire resistance. And we're seeing all of the issues with wildfires. This is a solution. This is the solution in my mind. So you, you're able to sequester carbon and you're able to have more water holding capacity, which deals with so many of these other issues. Um, I wanna bring up uh, white oak pastures. So I was just there in February with my husband. Um, white oak pastures is a regenerative farm in Bluffton, Georgia. It's Will Harris, he has about 3,200 acres down there. And it's amazing. He took my husband and I around in his Jeep for like three hours and showed us everything. And it's just so cool what they're doing there. And, uh, and there's a lot of places like this popping up all over the world. But um, he, they did a study on his land to show carbon sequestration. And this was from about a year ago. It was a third party testing agency that normally tests um, conventional lands and or conventional agriculture. And I know I don't have a very uh, fancy way to show you this, but this is the overall life cycle analysis of that farm. If you can see that, 
So it goes through like all of the actions that are happening. And at the end, you end up with a negative 3.5%, um, which is negative carbon. So like out of everything, like yes, there is carbon release, there's methane, all of these things that do happen. But because of the ecosystem working the way that it should, and everything in sync in that ecosystem, you end up with a negative action in terms of what, which means it's positive, but you end up with negative 3.5% carbon. And that's a uh, per pound of beef. So another portion of that study, this one's even smaller, this one right here, I love this one, because it shows these other numbers. So on conventional beef, we have a plus 33%, and that is the industrial animal agriculture way of raising cows. Plus 33% on pork, we have plus nine. On chicken, we have plus six. Beyond burger, we have plus four. Impossible burger, we have plus 3.5. And soybeans, we have two. White oak pastures beef, negative 3.5. And I've heard Will on a podcast say, um, that when somebody eats an impossible burger, they have to eat three and a half pounds of his beef in order to break even on the destruction on the environment. So again, this is looking at a bigger picture. It's like, just because you're eating an impossible burger doesn't mean that it's helping the environment because it matters where it came from. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. I do want to show, um, Sunny, I'm going to share my screen. I want to show this carbon cycle picture that's from Joyce Farms, which is on the East Coast. Um, here we go. So this is just showing uh, kind of that whole system that's happening, like what's happening with the cows as they're doing their action on the land. You have all the microbes that are, um, you know, converting nitrogen. You have the root exudates that are feeding all of the, the soil life. Um, you show the carbon drawdown, all of the different things that are happening in this carbon cycle. Like the picture is just a nice, concise way to see when you have strategically grazed livestock, which is what they write right there, they, the way they trample and naturally fertilize the land, it, um, it actually produces more carbon and life in the soil because that's, that's, the, uh, that's the evolution of how things are supposed to be. So, stopping my share. Um, so I just, I love that because it's, it's showing that greater system that we don't think about when we're reaching for something on the shelf at the grocery store. Um, and so uh, the next thing I want to show is there's a farmer uh, named Marcus McCulley. He's up in Boulder, he has M McCulley Family Farms, and he shared a picture in one of my events that I did a little while ago, and I'm going to share that as well. Um, so basically, I just want to explain real quick. So his fence line shares the open space, uh, Boulder County open space. Um, that's where his fence line is. So it's showing the difference between letting land rest, especially in an arid environment like here in Colorado where we don't have humidity and we only have seasonal rainfall. So it's showing what happens when we let land rest and then it's showing what's happening on his land because of those regenerative practices. Let me find that picture. All right, right here. I'm gonna try to make it larger. Okay. So um, you can see how there's at least, what is that? Probably a two and a half to three foot drop. So that's the amount of soil that is gone from that Boulder County open space simply because it was left kind of on a shelf, so to speak. So you can't just put land in an arid environment and set it aside and hope it's gonna be okay. That's what we do with our national parks and open spaces thinking that we're preserving it when actually it doesn't have the actions on the land that it really needs to be healthy. And then you see the guys in that other area and that's, you know, roots in the ground. It's got the interaction with the animals. So you have that soil being kept on that land and, and instead of just blowing off because, you know, Boulder gets so much wind, they lose a ton of topsoil um, when everything is desertifying and, and drying out because the grasses end up um, oxidizing when they don't have that ruminant interaction. Okay, I'm stopping my share. Um, so, you know, just some really stark contrasts of, of what can happen when we're not thinking in this more holistic way of, well, how did nature evolve and how did all of these systems evolve? And thinking about how we can be part of that as opposed to making our reductive decisions of, well, we want more yield or we want to do this or that. And so we're going to you know, just have this one monocrop over here. It, it just, it doesn't work like that because nature, nature never has a monocrop ever. There's a reason for that. We need diversity because diversity is strength. 
Um, we also have a lack of nutrition in our food and it's toxic because of the way that it's being farmed industrially. Um, and there's a really cool paper by Christine Jones. Um, she's a PhD. Her paper is called White Farming, Restoring Carbon, Organic Nitrogen, and Biodiversity to Agricultural Soils. And she shows here the mineral depletion in vegetables and the mineral depletion in meat just based on these agricultural practices. Um, and so it's just, it's really important for us to start understanding that it's, you know, these, these actions on the land that are destroying the land are also destroying our health because um, like I was talking about, that microbiome aspect of healthy living soil is what creates health for those things that are either eating the plants that we eat or just plants in general. So to get that level of nutrition that you would expect um, and to not have toxins as well. Um, and something that's interesting, I mean, for one, we're the most chronically ill nation in the world. The United States is the most chronically ill. And look at just how industrial we've become with our farming practices. It's, it's the most probably very close with Australia. Australia is probably close second on that. Um, but, you know, when, when you're doing these regenerative practices, you actually can't spray pesticides. On an industrial uh, farm, you actually have to spray pesticides. And I want to bring up that dichotomy as well, because on an industrial crop, you have no immune system for those plants because the soil is dead due to all of these other actions that have, that have happened, like no diversity, like uh, the soil being left bare for part of the year, like the tilling, you know, all these actions that have killed that life underneath the soil. Um, that, that's where that immune system and strength comes from for those plants. And so when you don't spray pesticides, yeah, you are going to have uh, those crops being taken over by pests because the plants can't defend themselves. Um, but in a regenerative system, when everything's working together, you can't spray pesticides because it would, it would actually ruin everything that's happening, all of the amazing actions that are happening within, within that ecosystem. Um, and probably some of you recognize um, Epic, uh, like Epic Meat Bars. Um, it also, Rome Ranch is a ranch that this couple owns. So this couple, Katie and Taylor, they were both vegans before they went into this venture. And now they have, they're running bison regeneratively on their uh, ranch in Texas. And I was listening to Taylor on a podcast uh, like a year ago, and he said back in 2018, there was this outbreak of army worms that happened that literally laid waste to all of the industrial fields around their ranch. He said farmers would go to bed and wake up with 80 acres gone because of these, this army worm outbreak, but nothing touched their land. And it's because of that, in, that uh, regenerative aspect of what they do versus the conventional um, aspect that has no, no protection, you know, for those crops. So again, diversity is strength. That's why nature operates that way. It also takes the burden off of oceans. When we go to this regenerative model, we're no longer losing topsoil and chemicals, you know, going down the waterways and ending up in the ocean. Um, we're sequestering carbon on land, so we're no longer burdening the oceans with having to sequester more carbon than they should be. So it really is just one of those things that's kind of that, um, what would you call it, I guess a hinge pen of what flips this entire thing. It's like 180 degree flip when we focus on especially regenerative local food, but it also goes to products and services as well. Um, so when we look at the, the root cause to find the root solution, it's our, it's our mindset. It's how we're thinking about things. So we flip our thinking. We flip our mindset to this expansive, collaborative, more inclusive, context-based way of thinking. And we've never done this before. I mean, this, this has been hundreds of thousands of years, more like millions of years, that we've been in this more reductive way of thinking of doing something and that's the action as opposed to taking in the full context. And what I really love, probably some of you have heard of Alan Savory. Um, this is his book, Holistic Management. The subtitle is A Common Sense Revolution to Restore Our Environments. And basically the way that he lays this out is the complete flip of how we currently think in society. So it's a series of questions that an idea is filtered through. So say you come together as a community or as people trying to figure out how to manage, holistically manage a piece of land. How do you move animals? How do you plant this or that? You, you have these different ideas that are gonna come up from different people in the group and you run those ideas through this series of questions and it creates the ability for everyone to learn together, whether that's an actual good idea and it's gonna work or whether it's going to be something with unintended consequences. If we were running our government like that, our economies, our communities, our food production, we would be in such a more 
balanced, peaceful place right now, but that's not how we've been doing it for a very long time. Um, so yeah, really, it, and he's, you know, he's really shaped a lot of my thinking because it's, that was kind of the last piece for me as I studied a lot of this. And this is not something that, uh, you know, we learn in school to this level at all. It's, it's something that when you start to peel back these layers and you start to realize like how huge this thing is and the fact that really we are the, we are the center of this thing, that humans are the only thing on the face of this earth that operates outside of natural systems, then you start to realize that, that we are that common denominator and it comes down to our thinking and how we operate in our societies and with the planet. Um, so it's really just in my mind, very simple, <laughs> even though it doesn't seem like it. Um, but you know, nature and the planet, our bodies, things want to regenerate, things want to heal. That's actually the, na the natural balance of things. We just continue to interrupt it. So when we look at a regenerative mindset, that ends up creating, um, it reinforces regenerative practices um, and, and it creates like an informed decision. And that's what determines the kind of management that we do. And that equals positive outcomes, which then reinforces this regenerative mindset and this positive aspect of abundance. So it's, it's this, it's like the reverse of where we're at right now, which everything is hitting. It's like those knock on effects of like that domino hitting the next domino. And we're kind of in this downward spiral of climate issues and health issues and the global pandemic and all this stuff. But when we flip to this other way of thinking and operating, everything starts to open up and become possible and positive and it's really exciting. And, and yet ultimately it's, it's actually kind of simple. We just haven't thought that far out in terms of that bigger picture. So yeah, living systems want to regenerate and you know, currently all of our complex systems are breaking down because they are all connected, but that's also hopeful that everything is connected because that's why everything can regenerate because everything's connected. So when we start this positive domino effect, it's going to affect everything and it's going to be a good thing. Um, Marcus McCauley from McCauley Family Farms, I love what he says when he starts off his talk. He asks the audience, um, do you know if your breakfast this morning improve the land. And no one ever knows that because it's like, what, wait, what, what does that even mean? But that is really the question that we have to ask. And, and when you've answered that question, if you can say, yeah, the eggs I had were, you know, pasture raised on this amazing farm, you know, 10 minutes for me. And uh, the bacon is this heritage breed of pork that's being raised out doing what they do out on the land and, you know, um, going around through the dirt and everything and living that life that they're supposed to. And that is regenerating the land. Same with beef, you know, same with veggies. All of these things, when they combine and you think about the fact that, uh, yeah, what I ate actually did regenerate the land. Oh, and by the way, it regenerated my health as well. It gave me an immune system. Um, it's just amazing when you see the impacts from that. Um, I was listening to a friend the other day, we were chatting about uh, the fact that he, um, he's from Florida and grew up there, but he would go up to his grandmother's farm in Canada and they raised cows up there. Well, they had a whole diverse operation happening. This was back in the day, uh, probably like 30 or 40 years ago. And he said he remembers getting like a, a big pitcher and just dipping milk out of the thing after they milked the cows. And he's like, that milk was so good and it felt good. And he said, but then when I was an adult and I started drinking milk, you know, from a, from a grocery store, he said I would get headaches and I had digestion problems. I felt like crap. And he said, I realized it's not the same. And same thing with, uh, he was saying he now puts honey in his coffee and now he no longer has allergies because he is getting those natural antihistamines from the honey because of where the bees actually are on the flowers. And that's part of our environment. So it helps us actually have an immunity to allergies. So it's, I'm like, you can apply that mindset to literally everything your clothing, products, services, food, it doesn't matter. This way of seeing that connection and where health and the lack of toxic um, stuff actually comes from is how we actually see this, this bigger picture that's like, oh, this is really amazing. Um, so I just wanna go over really quick a, a, a few of the common proposed solutions to deal with some of our massive issues like climate change. Um, what, the first one is renewable resources. And what I want to say about that is it, it doesn't fix the problem because technology cannot fix a biological system. It's something we need to head to or head towards and do, but we're, we need to look again at source and mimicking nature. Are those solar panels being sourced in a way that is not destroying nature? 
Um, do they last a long time? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that when you look at a holistic framework, you can see more of the answer of like, okay, well, if that's not the answer, what would we look at? So it's, it's again, it's kind of sending it through that holistic context. Um, and I want to say, <laughs> this is something that usually gets people's attention. Fossil fuels are not the problem. It's our management of them. And I did not say fossil fuel industry is not the problem because the way we are managing fossil fuels right now, um, that is a problem. It is creating a lot of issues. But if the fossil fuels themselves, they're not the issue because if they were just in the ground and we weren't blasting through them <laughs> like crazy, we wouldn't be having some of the impacts that we're seeing uh, with the vast amount of carbon that's sitting in the atmosphere. So that, that's, these are, again, those things that kind of break down and challenge belief systems that we've held on to for a long time, because I know I've had some people get kind of like, wait a minute, yeah, fossil fuels are the problem. And it's like, no, that's a resource. That can't be the problem. It's only how we're managing them. Um, another example would be, let's plant a bunch of trees. That's another commonly proposed solution. Well, if we're looking at the holistic context of that, um, that may or may not be a good idea. And yet that's one of the things it's like, let's just plant trees everywhere and hopefully that'll fix it. Again, it's that band-aid solution idea. And in, this, in the holistic uh, management book, he has a picture of these trees planted in a desert because they really wanted to regenerate that land. Well, that doesn't work when there's nothing to support the growth of those trees and the soils and everything like that. So it's literally the desert covering these trees at this point because it's, it was a, a like, oh, we really want to, you know, flip the, the desertification. But when you're not stepping back and looking at that bigger picture, those plant, the planting of those trees did not work. Um, and here's, this one's probably the most controversial one that I talk about is going vegan and removing animals from, ag from agriculture. So controversial question that I like to say is, are cows causing climate change? Nope. Same thing as fossil fuels. They can't cause climate change in and of themselves. The industrial animal agriculture aspect of how we are dealing with ruminants like cows, yes, that is part of that big time. Just like I showed you in that, that study, 33% you know, emissions from uh, industrially raised beef. So again, it's looking at, but, but what's the bigger picture? It's that system. Um, so no, cows are not causing climate change. Um, and I was out in California last year and I was talking to what I would describe as a hardcore vegan. Um, and she has been this way for, I think, 10 or 15 years. And after I went through this whole thing and like how nature works and how ruminants operate with the planet, she was like, you know, if I had access to meat like that, I would eat meat again. And I said, I totally get it because I was there myself in 2015. So, um, and I'm not saying that you need to eat meat. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. But as a vegan or a vegetarian, you need to understand where your food is coming from. Because like we saw in that study, um, the vegan options are still destroying the planet, just like industrial meat um, options are. Um, and something that's really sad that people, again, our disconnection from food and nature, people don't realize is um, in the industrial harvest of vegan food, any food, in the industrial harvest of it, it's, it's like you know, hundreds of thousands of animals and birds and reptiles dying um, just by the way that we do those industrial actions. I was listening to um, a podcast with a Canadian regenerative farmer and she said she's been on the field after an industrial harvest and she said the amount of death was just mind-blowing. And so again, where is it coming from? What is the source and is it mimicking nature? That's literally the only thing you have to ask yourself. And then everything else falls in line. By doing that, we're dealing with climate change. We're dealing with carbon sequestration. We're dealing with de-acidifying the oceans. We're dealing with animal welfare. We're dealing with our own health issues. We're dealing with uh, soil health and water holding capacity and wildfires. I mean, I know, I know it's a lot, but this is why I said at the beginning, I'm going to talk about some things that might kind of get your blood boiling a bit, but it's what we have to do when we're thinking about how do we actually get to the bottom so that we can, you know, this common ground so that we can actually come together and make these regenerative, holistic, collaborative decisions about how to do things, because that's what's going to flip this whole thing. So final thoughts just over the years as I've been studying and speaking on this, I've realized that when people really understand how nature actually works and what photosynthesis actually does and that our life actually depends on these things. Um, that's when they start to realize like, huh, 
like that same friend who was talking about the, the honey and his coffee and the, the milk at his grandmother's. He was like, you know, I spend top dollar on my camping equipment. Why would I not spend top dollar on the food that literally nourishes my body? It's those kinds of questions that we need to ask ourselves because it's kind of like sleeping on a crappy mattress. It's like, you're gonna have a bad day every day if you're not sleeping well. Um, same thing with your food, if you're not nourishing your body. So, you know, there's a lot of aspects I could talk about with how to do this regenerative transition with food access for food insecure people, with food deserts, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, but that goes into another whole realm, but it is possible and it is a transition. It just, it's gonna take a little bit of time and it's gonna take a lot of collaboration and empathy and understanding truly how nature works so that we can all come together in this common ground. Because the reason why we want that holistic context and that holistic framework to make these um, collaborative decisions is because everyone's always gonna have a different idea of what they think should be done. You know, be a vegan, don't be a vegan, plant trees, you know, till this land, do this regeneratively. But when you filter them through that holistic context, that is what is kind of that um, common ground and evens everything out so that it's no longer fighting about our beliefs or fighting about our opinions. It's about looking at that bigger context of like, well, we all want the same thing. We all want health. We all want a safe place to live. We all want the environment to be good and healthy. We want something for our, our kids and future generations. How do we do that? That's the question that needs to be asked. So, you know, we're the most disconnected from nature that we've ever been, especially the past 70 years. And it's, it's why the destruction of our planet is picking up speed, is that disconnection. Um, and so we finally need to realize we are not separate from nature and we need to reintegrate back in with nature and really think about this because it determines, you know, things like how we build homes, you know, is that regenerative? Is that thinking about the ecosystem? We're just, we've gone so far down this industrial path that it's like, how can we start changing these systems? And I think food is the number one place to do this because it has such a massive impact on the environment and has such a massive impact on our health, which helps us think more clearly when we feel good and then we're able to do more things that move us in this regenerative direction. So um, a quote that I really appreciate is by Albert Einstein, we cannot solve problems by using the same thinking we use when we created them. So it's, it's that regenerative mindset. It's obtaining this whole way of thinking through mimicking nature. And it's the kind of mindset we need in order to create the kind of world that we want together. I, I do believe it's that simple. So together we must choose to do something different and we must choose to do something um, better so that we can create something better. I believe that we can quite literally create a regenerative paradise. So that's kind of the, the element that I wanted to get out there and, and now we can start kind of having some discussion because I'm sure people have some ideas. <laughs> Okay, get myself off mute here. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, now would be the time to ask Mandy. Um, if you could just raise your hand. And again, if you click on the participants button on the bottom of your screen, it'll pull up another screen and there should be a raise hand button. So just put your hand up there. Or if you can't find that, go ahead and just put a star in chat or if you want to just type your question in chat and I'll read it off. Um, Anne, I see you have your hand raised, so we'll start with you. And don't forget to unmute yourself when you ask your question. <laughs> okay, um, my question for you, Mandy, um, I really appreciated your um, presentation. And what was going through my mind was if I wanted to participate in this more regenerative, holistic uh, mindset and pattern of living, what, what kinds of things could I begin doing immediately that would help, um, you know, myself and the planet move in that direction? Yeah, so if we're focusing on that food sourcing aspect, <clears throat> um, I have, and actually, uh, Sunny, we could, I could put this in an email that you could send out to all the participants, but I have a lot of places that I recommend, um, especially around Colorado that are doing these regenerative things. And um, one of the food, we actually have a food delivery um, uh, thing that we use called Kristen's Farm Stand. Um, and she only works with regenerative farms. That's it. So it's like, she'll stay as local to the front range as she can. But um, if she can't find a regenerative X, Y, or Z, she will go 
out to the next realm. And I know she gets regenerative lamb from Gunnison, from a 16-year-old uh, female rancher up there. Um, so it's, I, I think it's really about starting with that food aspect. And a lot of the food that my husband and I eat, we really do um, order from these kinds of places or um, have like a community supported agriculture thing where we can actually you know, do a pickup situation or something. What well, can you repeat the name of that? Uh, yeah, uh, Kristen's, farm Kristen's farm stand. And you can just go on her website and uh, it's super easy to, it's like a, you can just go through and shop and the deadline is Monday night and then it's delivered that week and it's in reusable bags, and then you put that out for the, the next time to get delivery, so. Nice, now yeah. is that Kristen with K-R-I-S-T-E-N, okay. Yep. yep, All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Mandy. Um, the next question is from Liz, and the question is, how can the transition take place from industrial farming to nature-based farming? Yeah, so that is one of those things where we kind of get into those different levels. So. When we're looking at people with the finances to spend a little bit more on food, um, it's supporting local regenerative farms, um, those community gardens that are doing things like I know frontline farming is, is one that's working on healthy food access, but also is doing these more regenerative practices. Um, and I'm always thinking in terms of like, you know, how can we do that on the level of people who have those finances? And then what are organizations that are working on healthy food access in these kind of more food desert scenarios. Um, and there's Grow House um, up in Denver that does a great job. Fleet Farming, if you haven't heard of Fleet Farming, they do um, front lawn gardening. And part of, uh, I believe part of the food that's um, grown on a lawn actually goes to um, a charity and that's a healthy food access aspect. So I think it's, um, it's really finding these different levels that we can support this. So like I said, with the, um, the CSA aspect and ordering food from these regenerative places. And like I said, I can give Sunny um, my, my recommendations on that. Um, but then also finding those organizations who are doing that work and supporting them. Um, I would love to see uh, some government money diverted so that we could start hiring people to grow food and community gardens. So we're kind of dealing with that, um, you know, more food desert aspect. Um, so, I really think the biggest thing for people to understand is we, we need that market signal because industrial farms are not going to switch um, if the market signal isn't there. It takes money and time to do that switch. There are organizations that are helping with that. One is called Slow Money. Um, it's Woody Tash who runs that organization out of Boulder. And they literally put together kind of a community finance um, aspect to start helping to fund that transition because we've also got land prices that are out of control um, that's more based on the amount of production that happened on that land as opposed to the actual land itself. So our prices are pretty, you know, super high. Um, so it helps to have that land succession aspect happen for especially younger farmers. We have a huge movement of young regenerative farmers that are starting to crop up and going back to the land and farming because they realize how important this is. Um, so it's, it's a culmination of all of these different ways to try to transition. Um, but the biggest thing for people to realize is if the market signal isn't there, it won't happen. Um, and so it really is consumers being aware of where their food comes from and whether or not it's improving the land. And a lot of that you can just do by, I mean, you can type in, um, you know, like regenerative farms, some things will come up. It is, you do have to do a little bit of digging, but uh, you know, a lot of them will talk, you know, they'll talk about those regenerative um, practices like Macaulay Family Farms. When you go to his website um, up in Boulder, he, it's, he talks all about regenerative. You can go on tours on his farm and he'll explain it all. So hopefully that answers the question a bit that it's really needing that market signal and then supporting these organizations as everything kind of starts to transition. Okay. Thanks, Liz and Mandy. Um, that's my question. The next question just went up the page. Hold on one second. Um, the next question is from Mark. And Mark asks, what are your thoughts on vertical and hydroponic growing that Square Roots Freight Farms and others are doing? Yeah, so I've been asked, like, you know, obviously hydroponics and aquaponics aren't regenerating land. So in my mind, it's not technically regenerative in that way. But I do consider it regenerative because right now when we're looking at this transition that we're needing to go through as a society and we're looking at cities and we're looking at suburbs and we're looking at the outer areas where we actually have 
farms on soil. Um, we need those transitional pieces in cities as well because we need local healthy food access. So yeah, there's a lot of organizations that are doing really cool stuff with hydroponics and aquaponics. And I believe that that is a regenerative aspect of this transition because we need that access close to home. Great. Um, does anybody on the phone have any questions? I do not see any more raised hands or questions in the chat, but I did see a couple people on the phone since you can't um, be in the chat. I wanted to see if you had any questions. If so, feel free to ask. And if anybody else has any questions, um, please feel free to raise your hand or put a star on the chat or type your question in the chat. Um, and if not, or if you're laying in bed tonight and you're like me and you think of an amazing question and said, oh, I wish I had asked Mandy this, um, she does have a website. It is www.tribegreenrising.com and she is also on Facebook. And as you can tell, she's very receptive and very knowledgeable about these issues and I'm sure she would be happy to answer any questions that you have um, and Mandy, I can give out your email. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It is uh, Mandy at tribegreenrising.com. And it's N A N D Y. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I would just also note that if you would like a re copy of the recording of this video, feel free to em email me at president at 350colorado.org. And I'll be happy to send you a copy of this video. The first couple minutes of it um, got cut off on Facebook Live because we're all sort of having internet issues lately. And But um, most of it is on there if you want to go back and view it. And of course, some, some people aren't on Facebook. So um, I did also want to note that uh, 350 Colorado does have a regenerative agriculture committee. And they meet monthly. And if you would like more information about that committee or would like to join in on one of the calls because this interests you, um, you can go to 350colorado.org or um, e uh, Micah has put the link to the website in the chat um, where you can sign up and also the Facebook page where that regenerative ag committee is located. And um, the only other thing I have is I'm going to type in Mandy's website in the chat right now. Green. Make sure I spell it right because I can't see because it's way too small. <laughs> and then her email. Okay. So if you, both of those are now in the chat. If you would like to get more information or for any reason you miss it, um, please feel free to email me. Um, I don't see anybody else with their hand raised or any other questions. I so, really want to say, if you don't mind, Sonny, that uh, yeah. Michael Alcazar, who talks to us fairly regularly about various things, is also a permaculture designer, which is another form of regenerative ag. And, uh, he is perfectly happy to, you know, help you set up gardens in your house, uh, you know, your neighborhood, your house, whatever, um, so that you can be sort of a personal part of this transition in terms of, you know, localizing to the maximum extent possible if you'd like. And I am happy to connect you with uh, Michael if you'd like. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat for anybody who would like to reach out to me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Amathia. Um, the only other thing of note is that um, 350 Denver is still having its local meetings. Um, they are going to continue on Zoom for the time being. Um, so just watch your emails for the next meeting. I'm not quite sure what the topic is, but we will be um, here at your computer the first Tuesday of every month. And also 350 Colorado is still actively engaged in a lot of projects um, despite a shut-in or a lockdown. Um, so please watch your emails for actions that you can take from home or things that you can do from home. And there's also a bunch of awesome um, webinars that are going around that you can do from home as well. 
And um, thank you, Liz. Uh, we would also like to note that today is Giving Tuesday. So if you are able to, we would certainly appreciate um, a donation. And that donation can be made at 350colorado.org on our website. Um, we are a grassroots movement, so all of our money comes from donations from people like you. And without you, um, we don't get to do fun stuff like what we did tonight. Um, and also all the actions that we've done in the past and will continue to do in the future. So if there are no more questions, I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. We really appreciate you having here. And also want to thank Mandy so much for her wonderful presentation. That was awesome. And we are so glad that uh, you could be here to educate us on healthy soil and regeneration. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. That was super. Thank you, Mindy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, and have a good night and stay safe. Good night. Good night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>